good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming along. We meet here every month. Uh, the the uh, third Tuesday of the month. Uh, and uh, tonight we have uh, uh, Fish Shaw, who's going to talk about the libertarian movement, libertarians' place in modern politics. Yep. So the aim of this talk is to look into the idea of a libertarian moment whereby there will be a particular turning point in the political environment that will provide a pathway for libertarian policies and governance. Regularly prophesied by libertarian parties, particularly in the United States, that, oh, there are people who are libertarians that just haven't figured it out yet. And so this idea, yeah, and looking in particular at the UK and its political context, as well as parts of the US political makeup, I hope to show why this moment has probably passed on by, and how libertarianism in its current guise has failed to mobilise on social, economic or political fronts. From that I hope to offer ideas and questions that may push forth newer conceptions of libertarianism that can address these failures and begin to look into new forms of politicking and understandings that can get us away from where I think the problem exists. So I'll start with an anecdote. Last year I went to a conservative student society debate at my university where in a discussion around conservative ideology I revealed I was a libertarian. It was upon that point he said, oh you mean like David Davis? For those who don't know that is the current Brexit secretary. And for me this statement seems to encapsulate the problem that libertarianism is both an ideology and a movement faces. This being that a significant number of people don't know what it means and they don't know what it represents, they don't even know what it does. Such a problem goes to the heart of libertarian engagement with modern politics, as the messages of liberty and free markets are packaged in ways that aren't interesting, engaging, or particularly informative to the concerns of the modern electorate, or indeed those who don't vote. Uh, however, it goes further than this, as political engagement doesn't just mean convincing voters during an election or setting up a political party, it means academic engagement and engagement with businesses and civic society, civic society organizations and other such political entities that exist around and within the governmental and the social systems. So on these fronts, there is, in my opinion, a failure of libertarian engagement, whether in the inability to gain sufficient political representation or to push a radical program of free markets. Possible, and, sorry, just, just stop you. Is it possible for you to speak louder and go a little slower? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just looking, I think they're, they're, they're not following you as well as they should be. No, no worries. So I'll start again, sorry, on the first oh, on the next, oh, on the paragraph that I'm at. Um, on these fronts, there is, in my opinion, a failure of libertarian engagement, whether in the inability to gain sufficient representation or to push a radical program of free markets and the decentralization of political and regulatory power. I think this springs from the inability to develop a coherent message to fully articulate and provide understandings of in the in of what free markets are and the radical potential they bring to, pe to change people's lives. With the modern failures of the state, libertarians could begin to develop narratives that criticize the fundamental issues that afflict people, such as the state's inability to regulate huge sections of the economy, as was obvious with the banking crisis and the subsequent bailouts in 2007 to 2008. The housing and planning systems are another area ripe for, criti for critique when it comes to the involvement of the British state and local governments in limiting supply driving up prices and subsidising landowners and landlords for a vastly complex, incomprehensible <laughs> system of taxes, benefits and subsidies. It could seriously be argued with the events of Brexit and the surge of turnout for Jeremy Corbyn, as well as similar events in Europe and America, that the Western polity, the modern idea of the state, is itself in significant crisis. Its failure at engagement, as with poor voter turnout figures and the increasing popularity of alternative media sources and forms of populism, suggests it is facing crises of legitimacy that question the innate purpose of vast political machineries and bureaucracies that get very little done and are inefficient in the use of the money that it has. Similarly, the range of economic institutions that are also being brought into question, losing their legitimacy as the realities of low pay, low productivity and pitiful economic growth begin to bite. In the recent UK election, nominally considered a game changer by political standards, as there was supposed to be a real choice on offer, as we heard, the choice between a true left and a now a true right, it could only manage 69%. And when you consider the elections in the 1950s and 60s, where there was meant to be a consensus politics around national Keynesianism and the idea of a strong state, they managed above 80%. It, you know, it involved offering a, free, a range of free goods, but no actual explanation of how they would be implemented, and yet still could barely creep above three-fourths of the registered electorate. During the, during the US election, we saw two of the most unpopular candidates ever fielded, and a turnout that barely limped over, 50, over the 50% mark. So you can see that 
people aren't interested in modern politics in the way that they're not engaged with these ideas. They're not engaged with the ideas of Jeremy Corbyn. They're not engaged with the ideas of Theresa May, Donald Trump, or Hillary Clinton. They're looking at it and they're thinking, God, this is still awful. They remember, you know, you go back to the ideas of, you know, the consensus politics that developed after Thatcher and into the era of New, new Labour, and people thought, that was really terrible. We need something different. And something has supposedly has come on that's different. People are going, well, that's really terrible as well. So there are significant crises in legitimacy that are found within Western states and large economic authorities, whether those be the nominally independent regulatory authorities and the range of lobbying and subsidised organisations that exist. And thus there are room for alternatives that believe in increasing real choice and freedom and moving away from the stultifying nonsense of modern politics and the monopolised economy that seems unable to provide for a range of people. For example, UK job satisfaction is at a two-year low, according to The Independent, with the largesse of the corporatised private sector seeing little in the way of opportunity or a desire to work. Yet where has the libertarian message been, one that actually lays the blame at the heels of centralised political and economic authorities who cannot possibly engage with the day-to-day -day lives of most people? One that offered actual control over people's lives through multi-scale arm market systems and the ability for workers to move beyond being simple employees toward a free economy of independent contractors and entrepreneurs. The lack of a narrative that has anything to say on these issues springs from libertarianism's seeming inability to forge a coherent understanding. At the moment, it is caught with a neo-corporatist support for the existing system that seems to believe our current forms of neoliberalism are in some way indicative of the strengths of free markets and private property. Significant tranches of prevailing libertarian thought seems to be invested in supporting many elements of the current system and taking an uncritical view of modernity. Advocates from a range of free market think tanks and academic groups regularly tout the supposed successes of free markets due to the reduction of poverty that globalization has brought forth. They talk of the beneficence that an international market system has brought and can continue to bring, such as larger levels of investment and higher levels of technological innovation. Things such as cheap food, easily accessible communication technologies, and the wider dissemination of information are all, oh, sorry, all made out to be the responsibility of globalization's dynamics. Now, now, there is certainly some truth to these claims. That, you know, there's no doubt that poverty has been generally reduced through the ability for entrepreneurs in many areas of the developing world to access capital, to be able to find new goods and new technological sources for innovation. Yet at the same time, they ignore many elements of statism which have been able to construct these dynamics. They ignore the land theft, which has been integral to constructing cheap labor forces in urban zones in Asia and Latin America, and the intellectual property systems that artificially monopolize technological innovation and its distribution. The transportation subsidies that make it artificially cheaper to separate global production networks across the world, and the forms of credit provision that make it easier for particular companies to access credit at preferential rates within subsidized forms of banking and investment. Such problems can be seen with the free market revolutions in the 80s that developed through the dictates of neoliberal leadership and the move from national Keynesianism. These have tended to co-opt elements within libertarian ideology, bastardizing it to a kind of milk toast belief in, free, in small government and lower taxes. Thus libertarians become useful idiots for the generalities of an existing system of production and regulation with the occasional reduction in income tax or licensing requirements to kind of allow them to look like they're actually doing something. Libertarianism is caught up in processes of what Gramsci would call transformismo, where they are being co-opted by the wider superstructure and ideology of the current prevailing state and production systems. They are being made co-optable to dominant ideologies, and as a result, the radical elements within libertarianism are being fundamentally removed and made singularized. They're made into basic policy proposals, as I said, smaller states, lower taxes. Now, there's no doubt those are good things, but where do you go from there? This is the question that doesn't seem to be answered. It's, it becomes limited in its capability to address existing issues and to level its own critiques against the prevailing systems of, pardon me, of economics and politics. The most facile elements of libertarianism are given credence while the radical potential is swept under the carpet. It presents little of substance, having practically nothing to say to populations adversely affected by the processes and dynamics of modern globalization. Libertarianism becomes consistently viewed as some sort of regulation light, lower taxation policy system that takes an uncritical view of modern globalization. Such a perspective is encapsulated in what Gary Johnson was saying in the 2016 US election, that libertarianism is fiscal conservatism and social liberalism which reduces the full heterogeneity of libertarian thought down to basic proposals, ignoring fundamental questions around taxation, coercion, and the role of the state. 
It can't really comment on systems of post-politics found, found in Western states today, whereby a general consensus and certain policies develop, have developed so that so where certain policies have developed that tend to increase the processes of centralization and move towards systems that that tend to ignore the full expanse of free markets. So what's my place here? Yeah? So it wouldn't, and it, and it gets caught as well in these kind of processes of centre ground politics. So as I mentioned with the post politics idea, libertarianism now seems to kind of unquestionably believe in the, the benefits of modern democracy. We saw that with elements of the, Bre of the EU referendum, where many libertarians would go, well, the good thing about the EU referendum is it's giving people a democratic choice. But the fundamental issue is with that is it's not much of a choice. So we see that. It's only reaction to things like new forms of politics with populism, with the increasing belief that a larger state is good, is to consistently promote the benefits of the existing political economic order, touting it as a major form or, or step sorry, toward a full free market system. What can this possibly say to issues surrounding generational unemployment, deindustrialization, and fears surrounding immigration? What can it say to young people who are unable to afford house and rental prices and who take on vast levels of debt to afford? The basics, the basics of life, whether that be forms of education, whether that be the ability to rent a house. What does it say to people who want to become entrepreneurs who face massive entry barriers to the existing forms of state-led globalization? All it can do is effectively support an order constructed through multiple forms of statism, tacitly making the current system out to be the closest we have come to reducing the power, and the, the power of the state and empowering free markets. Thus, if there exists a marketplace for ideas, then libertarianism is clearly failing. In the US presidential election, as I mentioned, there was a choice between a form of Clintonite social liberalism on the one hand and Trump's national populism on the other, both of which proposed a huge expansion of the state and false promises of national renewal and a strong international order. In the UK election, two forms of statism presented themselves that believed in industrial strategies, state-led policies, and the idea that you can continue to subsidize and subsidize to prosperity. Even during the EU referendum, two visions of corporatism presented themselves, whether it be the Remain campaign's unquestioning belief that the EU is the utopia that it never has been, or the Leave campaign's belief that by simply willing it, we can have systems of free trade in the modern world while ignoring that tacit statism which exists beneath it. Thus, the modern changes in politics seem to be moving towards statism, and the masses of people who don't take an interest in electoral politics aren't exactly calling for a libertarian revolution. Modern politics has itself become a bastion of pointless politicking for, uh, that ignores the overt issues that people, different people actually care about. Politicians are happy to continue to screw up the housing market in this country. They are happy to start pointless wars that can, that, which cause more harm than good, and they continue to live under the, under the delusion that an authority as large as the state can actually direct, either through a, ta a tacit or explicit means, an integrated economic system. However, many libertarians also live under similar delusions, meaning they are happy to support ameliorative reforms, such as shifting the burden of taxation from income and wealth toward consumption, furthering the independence of central banks, and generally tending to lend support to right-of-center political parties, encapsulating that idea of the lesser of two evils. So libertarianisms, libertarians seem, right, seem happy to put their support behind austerity, which in the current context is a frankly meaningless word, as government finances have increased, debt has increased, and the overall burden of the state has not been significantly reduced. Thus it seems the libertarian moment, as, consi as consistently prophesied, has gone by, at least in the watered-down versions that seem to gain the most public presence. It generally seems that libertarianism in this regard has little to say, and what it does say tends to get co-opted by in, in forms of political engineering that favor a larger state and particular distributional coalitions within it. The existing political and economic systems favor centralization and the control of information. Such a system will happily apply certain libertarian policies when it favors their political position, but otherwise it will portray libertarianism as a kooky, outlandish set of ideologies and policies that will supposedly never gain traction. This then raises two fundamental questions. One, is the political order worth working with? And two, can libertarianism be made into something more than the neo-corporatist idea it is currently seen as? Maybe rather than David Davis or some other politician being seen as a major representative of, neo of liberta libertarianism, 
It could instead develop generalizable and coherent understandings that actually answer the political and economic questions that are currently being asked. If there is to be an actual libertarian moment, whether that be in building a general counter-institutionalism against predominant state structures or gaining greater public awareness, it needs to break with simplistic narratives that support the predominant forms of globalization and neoliberalism, and that asserts that markets are the main aim of libertarianism, and that instead does not view modernity in the uncritical way it tends to do now. Such potential may already exist with the recent populist risings that have characterized electoral politics over the last few years. False narratives such as the new paradigmatic dichotomy of nationalism and globalism are beginning to spring up and supposedly are beginning to displace left and right. Yet it seemed with the recent election, when two forms of statism were placed against each other, neither gained a full enough to support to gain a majority. People just don't seem to be that engaged with, with this kind of hype, with all this kind of talk of a new paradigm, it's proved pointless, it's proved relatively pathetic, and it's constituted by a number of undeliverable promises, which simply, you know, hope for something and hope for something tomorrow, which they don't have today. But as I mentioned, all the, but as I mentioned, simply turning against that and going, well, if we're, if we're against populists, that means we're globalists, has its own problems. You know, it ignores the state's in, intervention in creating forms of globalization. And it, and it ignores the way that state control has been strained through a number of international organizations and independent regulators. Instead of moving in this direction, such a dichotomy should be ignored and pushed against, thus opening a political space where it can be disregarded through a genuinely radical libertarianism that is all-encompassing, moving beyond simply understanding the market towards an integrated theory of society that presents genuine alternatives to the centralization of political and economic power. Such a libertarianism should be focused on creating, on me, on created on uh, creating integrated alternatives to the present political and economic orders, focusing its criticism on the extent of massive economies of scale, the stringency of internationalized trade and property agreements, and the post-political world upon which this is based. For example, the existing economies of scale are the fullest representation of state-led intervention, which favors large established actors and removes control from communities, individuals, and free markets and those who live within them. Normally presented as a natural progression of market forces, modern economies of scale have been effectively constructed by states and supranational organizations through a range of subsidies and mass infrastructure funded not by those who use it the most, but by the general taxpaying population. The majority of modern corporations are part of this oligopolistic system, whether unintentionally or intentionally. Thus, you see a huge range of entry barriers that are constructed through lobbying efforts and the revolving door between established businesses and major regulatory agencies, which limit the effects of market competition and allow for the development of monopolies and oligopolies that lead to centralized pricing systems and the limitation of either entrepreneurial activity or market competition. These systems are held in place by legislative efforts, including TRIPS agreements, bilateral trade agreements, and a range of licensing and capital requirements, which produce a floor below which business, business becomes either very difficult or practically impossible. Take, for example, the internationalized model of intellectual property, which has been increased in scope, enforcement, and scale, limiting the effects of entrepreneurial innovation and market-based price discovery. The lack of correlation between intellectual property and innovation shows that it isn't particularly useful in encouraging innovatory activity and can even be regressive when considering the capability it has to limit production, for, uh, limit the produ production of particular products in different regions. For example, take Nike, who not only has a trademark on their signature tick, but has IP rights on the generic design of their trainers, meaning that potential competitors in the countries where these are produced, such as many areas of Southeast Asia, are legally unable to do so. They cannot produce either knockoffs or similar copies. And this thus limits the expansion of competitive products as well as the expansion of genuine entrepreneurial innovation. This serves to upscale economies beyond simple production and consumption within particular regions, creating new layers of complexity and bureaucratic engineering which serve to exponentially increase costs and levels of capital and income required to service these costs. Intellectual property in its current guise is simply the means to monopolize the flows of knowledge and information, limiting their entrepreneurial and emancipatory potential in favor of stringent control that maintains the largesse of existing economic institutions. When combined with the internationalization of investor rights and the significant limitation of liability, we have a corporatized charter that is, un is completely inimical to free markets under any definition. 
The flows of technology are another area that are negatively affected by artificial upscaling created by state-led intervention. Fears of technological unemployment are normally seen as part of the innate problem of market and profit systems, where they reduce, where they, where to reduce costs, businesses cut employment in favor of program machines. However, this ignores that technological innovation is simply a process. It occurs, it develops, it moves forward. And then its flows and delineations are down to, the, to who controls these processes and how they are applied. In the modern economy, it may well be responsible for unemployment because of the huge entry barriers which limit entrepreneurial activity and the development of independent contracting over the existing employment relation. Is the state's use of licensing, wage and price setting and its ability to monopolize, which limit the ability for technology to lead to innovation and new economic activity. So this is where the concerns of many people are today. When they look at the world, they're worried about their employment prospects. They're worried about their capability to get on in life with the range of increased costs around, li around living and the range of entry barriers to access the ability to become an entrepreneur or even a, even a contractor in a business. Thus, the drudgery of modern employment that discourages independent activity and the upscaling of economies beyond any form of control except through centralised institutions are where many people begin to feel the pain. I think if you look at the EU referendum as an example, it, the EU beforehand was never really registered as a major issue. No one really looked at it and went, oh, I really care about the EU. Yet people did vote to leave in the end. And I think that comes down to this inability to look at their life and think, I have control over what I do. Thus, the effectiveness of Vote Leave's slogan, Take Back Control, it comes from the idea that people don't really believe they have control in the modern world, whether that being deciding how they want to live their lives economically or how they want to see themselves in a social and political, a political sense. So when you look at libertarianism's focus, I think it should be on furthering this critique and its reach in space activity and involvement. It should look at the modern economy and not go, well, we've got something good, let's support this as much as possible. And so we need to put it in more of a, what can be considered a dialectical form, which is we can understand that many elements of the modern economy are good. No one doubts that. But at the same time, look forward and go, well, what potentials the free markets actually have? Where can they lead us? What differences do they have to the modern, croniest market system that we have today? So libertarianism and ideology that tacitly supports modernity and its subsidized systems of unfree markets cannot compete in the kind of political reality which is developing, which is beginning to focus on what people want in their lives and how they can control that. It promotes unpopular solutions that are incoherent considering the full extent of state involvement in the economy. I think rather a libertarianism that supports a pluralistic, decentralized world of differently scaled markets and political systems has a better basis in reality. It has the ability to actually talk about what people believe in. You know, if you look at the EU, you can argue this is a secessionary movement or a secessionary um, kind of thing that has occurred. And from there, I think you can begin to open up more of these radical questions. So this means attempting to move beyond the existing political order and producing spaces of exodus that allow individuals to engage in genuine forms of choice and free activity. This doesn't mean rejecting industrialism or employment relations. It means, as Foucault describes, opening a genealogical understanding of politics and economics that provides more possibilities. Instead of there being one pathway, there can be many pathways. And I think the ability for markets to provide that, for individuals to become what they want to be within markets, that's where its strength is. So if someone wants to be an employee in a nine to five job, then let them, there's no problem with that. But for those who are caught in the current vagaries of the socioeconomic system, it is about allowing them to escape from that, allowing them to have a space of actual freedom where they can engage in free market activity and to develop different institutional and political orders on many different scales. It should move towards a political order that emphasizes the ad hoc of civil society over the regimented democracy of today and pushes forth a popular litigiousness of decentralized policies and juries that have actual say over regulation and taxation. This pushes against the processes, processes of homogenization, which aim at curtailing the radical ends of free markets, instead of offering a vision of overlapping jurisdictional governance that incorporates the multiple identities of people within the political order, while pushing against the, what is an overt politics of violence, as can be seen to an extent in the United States, where the, the polarization of left and right there is actually beginning to feel, feel itself, beginning to be seen as well as against the kind of the post-political order which has developed in the, la in the last 20 years or so. 
Thus, it emphasizes a range of alternatives that present the reality of an interstitial economy, something that exists within the, vague, within the lines and delineations of the modern economic system and how unfree it is. Such alternatives comprise a decentralized set of possibilities, including the knowledge sharing systems of peer to peer production, the descaling innovatory activities of network small scale producers, and the move towards decentralized technologies, as seen with things like the blockchain and 3D printing. They all present some particular nodes in a wider network that allows for individuals to become economically and politically independent, gaining meaningful, meaningful control over their lives. I think the popularity of the idea surrounding decentralization and descaling are obvious to see. From the most basic campaigns against library closures and the desire to see public services made responsive to the local population, to the range of alternative economies that have sprung up, such as the Transition Towns movement and the Men's Sheds Collective. Now, these, these are, and they may seem petty, yet they are the result of people genuinely wanting control over their social and economic environments within the context of significant strictures imposed by centralized authority. Similarly, the vote for Brexit represents the outlet of dissatisfaction. It is that kind of secessionary moment where I think if we can take it further than the basic of let's just leave the EU to saying, well, let's question where centralized authority lies. Does it lie at the level of the EU? Well, according to many, many in the British electorate, it doesn't. Should it then lie at the level of the centralized British state? And I think from there you begin to see where people are moving towards this idea that decentralization, the ability to have meaningful control, is feasible. So decentralization in this sense is best described as a kind of a universe of networks, a kind of system of pluralistic overlapping governance that incorporates identity instead of destroying it as the modern precepts of globalization and post-politics seem to. Such can be seen in the idea of what, um, of what has been called an alter modernity, one that neither rejects modernity in its material elements, we don't reject, no one rejects technological development, no one looks and thinks, well, I'd rather live in the 13th century. But at the same time, can look back to the past and go, well, there were interesting decentralized systems of law and governance, which you don't have today. For, an, for example, I was reading a book recently that described that illiterate peasants probably had a greater grasp of their understanding of feudal tenure law than any tenant now has of tenure law in the UK. Let's remember, these people are illiterate and poor as dirt. And it's quite an interesting comparison to make. So this is where libertarians of philosophical aim should be, not in cultivating and simply accepting the realities of modernity that present a world along one track, but in creating a world where the free movement of ideas allows for many different pathways that coalesce into different theoretical junctures and networks. It should allow people to actually take back control, not through petty votes and elections or referenda, but through a range of alternatives that expose the overdetermined nature of our political and economic lives. However, such a project of decentralization and economic empowerment may not be achievable without a full systemic break that projects for the innumerable alternative modes of production and consumption into a kind of coherent alternative. It may be, it may be that it requires an actual significant economic crisis, as in Spain or Greece, where the 15M and Syntagma movements have pushed forth new political and economic models that represent their respective economic and political crises and that have developed new pathways towards general economic freedom and forms of property relations. In other words, any sort of libertarian development will need to evolve from the small scale, from the interstitial alternatives that exist in, pardon me, in plethora throughout the world, where from the decentralized production model seen in Shenzhen, China, and the black markets of Southeast Asia, to the alternative currency, cooperative ownership, and men's sheds movements found in England and Western Europe. Such a range of alternative forms shows that people see it as genuinely important to their lives to actually have these forms to escape from the kind of the wider economic and political world. However, such a model of political, political and economic relations to fully evolve beyond the kind of modern forms of statism and economic corporatism, it may require that revolutionary break. There are consistent historical examples of decentralized activity providing meaningful alternatives for a range of individuals. Yet we never see that fully integrated system develop from the kind of the conception of overnight communities to the understanding of having, uh, to the kind of the, the, wide, the widespread European city-states. They all kind of present an example of decentralized, non-homogenous political and economic orders. And yet they've all seemingly failed. 
And I think, but, this, but then again, that doesn't mean waiting, as Marxists do, for the revolution with bated breath and always saying it's around the corner, don't worry. I think it means exposing the stupidities of the existing political order wherever possible, as with things like the Brexit referendum, as with things like the UK and US general elections. In terms of what accelerations have called it, it means actually willing forth the crises of legitimacy and finance to allow for a full break with the prevailing system, allowing for varied populations to take advantage of such ensuing chaos. Fundamentally, libertarianism needs to disconnect with neo-corporatist managerial policies that aim at semi-privatized public services and some undefined idea of a small state, and instead to move toward a, a theory of decentralization and pluralism that aims at redefining the economic variables around scale, property, and markets, and pushes against both that kind of Schmittian politics of violence on the one hand and the post-politics of homogenous consensus on the other. It means the ability to have different jurisdictions of which one can consent to and different voluntary forms of governance upon which one can become a sovereign individual. This, mean, this then means then that libertarianism has no place in modern politics, precisely because the point of libertarianism should be to transcend the current forms of political order rather than attempt to co-opt or accede to them. When politicians continually push for more state involvement to correct the problems it's created, libertarianism should be there to just say more, to say more than just no, but to provide alternatives that are developed from the ground up. When tragedies such as the Grenfell Tower fire occur or when energy price tariffs go up consistently and trains always run late, we should do more than resist the expansion of the state. We should make the case for decentralization and community-led alternatives, for genuine forms of privatization that doesn't mean the externalization of costs onto the state and glorified forms of cronyism. And it means the ability for individuals of all classes and creeds to have actual control over their lives. From here, we can be begin to develop spaces of exit that encourage freedom and a foot outside the prevailing state system. This form of libertarian politics ignores the state in its current form. It doesn't look to it as the solution. And instead, it looks to provide descaled alternatives that allow for meaningful control over one's life and meaningful engagement with new political environments. Any questions or criticisms? Bob? That's, it's unusual uh, and refreshing that someone argues for a smaller state insofar as it has to be smaller because it's a small state. It's, it's a small population. It's not that the state does less, but there are many states, and most of them are going to do less. Yeah. And there's going to be freedom of movement from one to the other. Soon. So I found that refreshing. Uh, I don't think it was right at this point. No. I will add to that. I think that what's interesting is, is that there is a significant historical precedent. So you have the, the development of Euro, what can be considered kind of modern European capitalism or free market activity, developed not from the kind of the centralized national, nationalities of kind of French nationalism or German nationalism. It developed in those multiple city states within those kind of trading and free movement relations that allowed for those who felt they were oppressed by the rural life to move to the city if they chose to and involve themselves in the artisanal and the guild forms of production. But at the same time, also allow for the kind of that that kind of feudal system to also exist and allow for people to have more choice over their lives. And as I say, going back, you know, the fact that there are tenant farmers in the 15th century who could understand law better than today is both depressing in the sense of it shows how bad education systems are, but also depressing in how complex law has become that it requires multiple degrees and possibly a doctorate to possibly get your head around it. I would add that. Um but these city-states much to be desired. Although, of course, since all of them are practicing free movement, free importation, and free export, there are as centers of um, the noise. I think it might go back to the where it was prior to before. It probably will. <laughs> no, Sorry, Bob. City-states, I think you were saying. Yeah. No, no. Carry on. No. <laughs> uh, is there any more? Sure, there will be. Can we take it outside? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I know, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I'm, sure, I'm sure my face is at all is dripping. It's not actually helping at this point. It's less loud than now. The electricity is creating more heat than it's actually providing. Yeah, I think all the cold rose are 
has been sucked out of the room. <laughs> 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 but I thought if I switched it off, it might go back to how it was earlier. Tell, tell me more about uh, copyright. You said about Nike. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, if, you know, if they were a copyright of generic trainers, that would be a bad thing. But mm -hmm. surely some copyright protection is good just because it, you know, it needs stable business. So, to an extent, it depends. Um, where would you draw the line? Yeah, yeah well, I, I think going beyond that, um, is intellectual property in its current form the best way to guarantee innovation? And I does, I, that, that doesn't seem to be the evidence for that. Baldrin and Levine recently wrote a, a book against intellectual property where they took a number of cases, particularly in Southeast Asia where the major production units are, and they've actually shown that there's no significant link between innovation and, in fact, that the ability to produce knockoffs has actually in itself potentially created more innovation. So I mentioned Shenzhen. In the Shanzai system, of knockoff production there, they've produced iPhones with replaceable batteries. Now, I don't know if anyone here owns an iPhone, but the one thing that really pisses me off about it is the fact that when the battery goes, the whole phone dies. And the fact that it's got a replaceable battery, it may seem a petty innovation, but it's a significant consumer innovation all the same. And it's also the fact that I think intellectual property comes into a wider system of these upscale economies, or you know, far, far beyond kind of the normal balance of economies and diseconomies of scale. So Kirkpatrick Sale in his book Human Scale noted that of the major consumer innovations from the 1950s to the 1970s, over 50% were produced in small workshops by people who didn't have access to patent protection. So I think, there, and so going back to your original question, where do we draw the line? You, it may well be proper that a company has the ability to have a trademark on a particular thing it's created. So a tick, I could kind of understand that because, well, that is part of its fundamental brand. But beyond that, I don't think that it's actually going to help with innovation or stable business. And in fact, I think having a really competitive environment at many different scales within markets is the best way to produce innovation. I think history, to a large extent, shows that. Anyone else want to speak? Bob? I thought of what I was going to say. And given the city states, and they can set in some ways, they can be different, they can be varieties of land, or another way, varieties of governments. They may have property laws, this, that, and the other, environmental laws, not so much environmental laws. The important thing, obviously, is that there should be no um, tyranny or oppression. Now, for this, it could seem to be almost as kind of um, a gentlemanly or womanly thing to do. The decent thing to do is that those who wish to leave can leave. As long as people can always get the hell out of it. Yeah. That's the important part. The rest of it, voting is not so important. You know, if you can't get out of the place, <laughs> you're in dead yeah. trouble. Yeah. You know, if there are, if there are landmines, barbed wire, and you know, machine gun towers, that's, ha that's, ha that's happened. Um, that's bad. So in a sense, you don't have to declare this. Well, to declare it, but it's just understood that decent places to live we're not permit, you know, we're not denying people the right to just get yes. Fundamental, I think and that's take their money with them. Yeah, I think that's one of the fundamental main things, is the ability, because I don't think you're going to see a, a cultivation of consent simply through contract. I think that's a bit too far in the modern political systems that we live in. I think the best way to do it is to basically allow people to leave if they so choose, and to have a number of smaller polities and government, governments that give people choice within their range. I mean, at the moment, yes, you could move to a different country, but the homogeneity seems in the way that states engage in international governance means it's very difficult to get anything better. And even if you did, they're usually so far away, it's a bit redundant. Well, there's much wrong with the world. Um, what to do about it. Um, now, I think the only thing we can do about it is to try and increase the number of more radical libertarians and make it radical libertarian art. The ordinary people are going to be in this in a very deep analysis like that. They are, this is why they think it ends up the message of being small, small state, lower taxes, mm -hmm. enterprise, that sort of thing, fewer, fewer intrusive regulations, less than the states. <clears throat> All of those things are good. Um, but you need more more people at the very leading edge of intellectualism that know the really radical argument and transport it through. And then <clears throat> the question is what, what might be back, what, what existing movements might be back that we see in the world today? And Rothbard, what you should do is you try and spot movements and back them, probably get it all wrong, change your mind, do the opposite. So for instance, would you back the current drive for Scottish nationalism? Uh, so that seems to me to just, you know, a lot of the modern secession movements just want, you know, what 
see that they can launch yeah. the I think that comes. Yeah, I think I think that comes back to the accelerationist argument I put, which I think that if the Scottish state did go into pain, it'd probably collapse. I, I, I just don't doubt it would fall into an inevitable crisis because the SNP doesn't know how to govern, and and the the other parties are supported are usually very farther to the left than the SNP, so you know they'd, they'd be redundant. So I think I would support nationalism in the kind of sense of well, it'll inevitably release some form of chaos in which there may be the ability to develop better policies as a kind of hopeful range. To add to the point on the radical libertarian point, I think there is a problem within radical libertarianism. I was, go I was going to add it to this, but I decided not to because I thought it was a bit too tangential. But the point I wanted to make, the point I was going to make is that even within radical libertarianism, there seems to be a huge amount of sectarianism. And I've seen this before. I was a member of the Center for a Stateless Society until, for some reason, last month they kicked me out. And I mean, they literally blocked me on everything. <laughs> it's quite funny. I didn't realize why. But I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, I didn't know what I, don't know what I, I said that was wrong. Probably saying, like, I don't believe in intersectional feminism. But irrelevant of that. Um, yeah, and, they, and they, they hate on a huge amount of radical libertarian groups, from the Mises Institute through to elements of, um, well, now it's Mises UK, but the former <laughs> Libertarian Alliance under Sean Gabb. They've really been critical of that. Keith Preston at Attack the System, I don't know if you know of him, he, um, he, he, he wrote something about how he doesn't think anarchism should be simply focused on cultivating things like feminism and, um, uh, and kind of de-racialism or whatever it is, this kind of intersectional theory. He thinks it should be more than that. And they, and they said they castigated him. So I think even within radical libertarianism, there's a real problem of sectarian infighting, which is so petty and so silly, and I see it yeah, all the time. Yeah, I know what they all, I know they all are. Yeah. I know what they all do. Uh, I, don't, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think they're going to, it's possible to get away no, from this. This endemic in French movement. Yeah. And uh, it happens on the left as well. Um, and I think that's probably the case with the radical libertarianism. No, I, I think, yeah. It, it doesn't matter. The sexual society makes good you eat so well. No, and I don't care. I find it funny. Still get the ideas out there, especially with the internet. The only you have the approval of Roderick Long and his his feminist sidekicks or whatever is not. He actually seems one of the more rational. I think it's nowadays William Gillis who's the director. He's the one you think, oh Jesus. So I don't, but I don't think any of that hinders the spread of the ideas. The other trouble is that you tended to imply that we needed to not not that we should go out trying to create or look for, but that uh, some you know chaos might be uh, some sort of devastating event might be an opportunity. Now most of us, even though we might have a right to mind, live fairly bourgeois lives. We really don't want to listen to some sort of you know hell <laughs> for some possible utopia on the other side, which probably wouldn't happen. Um, and I think you know, so insofar as disaster is coming, uh, then you know, try and ameliorate it. I don't think we should okay. sort of, we should try and bring about disaster in the hope that we shake things up in a think That's a mad idea. I think it's more that, I, I, you know, I, I said it a bit tongue-in-cheek, I guess, but I think the main thing is that if you, crisis will happen, because the way that current political and economic governance goes, it's, it's, there's almost inevitability to it. You look at the housing problems within the south, southeast of England, and in fact, over large pockets of England, that is a crisis that's waiting to happen. And I think the best thing for libertarians to do is to get in there with intelligent critiques that move the debate away from this idea that we should um, simply expand the state. So, you know, we hear all the time, we need more planning controls, that's what will stop the housing crisis, or we need more in the way of stopping immigration, that will solve for the housing crisis, and that's all rubbish. And I think it's the ability for libertarians to exploit that part of it. And I don't think, simply believing that chaos is a good thing doesn't mean you shouldn't be ameliorative of it. I mean, you look at the 2007 to 8 financial crisis, you know, was it the end of the world? No, it wasn't. But there was, I think, a capability there for people to expand their ideas. And alongside Marxist economics getting a higher reading, I've read areas that Austrian economists got a higher reading as well after the 2008 financial crisis. That's important. Brexit is important because it's a political crisis in the sense of the political elites, they don't have a clue what to do about it, as we can see with the recent election. And it's about libertarians finding those spaces and really exploiting those, whether that be ameliorative or chaotic is up to the individuals and groups involved. But I think that's where the, the real debate should be. And I, I think also, you know, people like David Davis uh, shouldn't just be ruled out. Uh, they, they have open minds, and I think this is the uh, new deputy in the Brexit Fund, mm -hmm. Baker, exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah, he's actually aware of the economics and the mm -hmm. thing. Uh, so, uh, so these ideas do have a foothold in the door. So mm -hmm. they good thing. It's unlikely that Davis will turn up the Brexit negotiations and say, well, look, we're not paying you anything. <laughs> and we're not here to have good relations with you. We want out, and we want to see your organisation smash. Um, which is what we <laughs> the correct view, of course. But, um, but, 
not not that we want to not, not that we want to buy you off. Yeah. We can plow on for more years. Nah. Yes. We think we think the whole thing's wrong. Yeah. Not to, not to on Britain now. We want to export the revolution, but so. I think it, I think it's yeah. I think it's about sensible engagement with politicians. Well, we don't want to at the end of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's about sensible engagement with politicians at the end of the day. I mean, Steve Baker's probably the, the only libertarian I can identify in Parliament. Douglas Coswell was kind of considered libertarian, yeah, but well, also foreign policy is awful on, truly atrocious. And, that, and I think that's where you need that careful engagement. I saw this when libertarians talked about how good UKIP was, and that really has not worked out whatsoever. And I think, you know, you do need to be careful where you, where you plant your seeds in terms of that. UKIP uh, did change. I mean, uh, we had a UKIP talker here at that time. UKIP had a hell of a lot of uh, young members who were reading Rothbard and yeah. I'd never I'd never come across there were more people reading some Rothbard in UKIP than there were in the LA. God, <laughs> God, God, God is living once they're more colourful characters by Rothbardian and now the honorary president of Keir Martin's That's right, yeah. Organisation or something. But what happened is that you know, the public, I mean the public did with UKIP a bit what they did with Sinn Fein in Ireland. Sinn Fein in Ireland was a a non-violent group uh, investing in culture and so on. But the public decided to associate them with the IRB, who later became the IRA, and they came into Sinn Féin, as they are now, one half of a uh, you know, uh, uh, warmongering uh, effort to conquer Northern Ireland. Uh, likewise, uh, for I suddenly see, thought, thought that, notwithstanding getting out of Europe, immigration was the thing, and he jumped on the bandwagon. And it changed, and, and a lot of uh, those young uh, libertarian UKIP at that point, uh, all of them were quite young actually, most of them were under 20. Um, well, quite a lot of them got kicked out, is it? They may have got kicked <laughs> out, marriage, they left anyway. Gay marriage is one of the they, 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 they might have got kicked out, but a lot of them left. Yeah. So, no, I think, yeah, that's the problem though, is that UKIP, they had potential, particularly their 2010 manifesto, it talked about, you know, things like, you know, saying that you've never seen a political manifesto, flat taxes, and that's from coming from you, I don't think that's radical enough. But that's still, for a manifesto, they talk about flat taxes, they talked about trying to put market elements into the NHS. Like, wow, that's quite interesting. And then I can understand why they moved away from that, because if you're a party who looks like they're on the cusp of electoral capabilities, you're not going to promote the privatisation of the NHS because you'll die electorally completely. But the problem is they have died now. I don't see a UKIP revival, not under people like Paul Nuttall, who's more interested in criticising Muslim headwear. That's not interesting. <laughs> Exactly how the system works. You can't no, that's what, yeah. bring up the party to a certain level without changing your agenda away from the yeah, material towards this, this this usual mainstream. So it's not an accident. This is happening everywhere. Mm. So I, I think this party politics for libertarians might be good here and there to promote that, something to yeah. get someone in the media. But you shouldn't bet on it that a party exactly. will actually win unless there is a general change of mm. opinion in, in, in the public. No, you have to you make. Eventually, when we're ready for this, we're nowhere near ready now, when we've got a majority of these chairs, you have to make an instrumental use of both yes. of the big parties for tax cuts, for yes. rolling back the state in a peaceful manner without having to uh, shoot anyone. We don't want to shoot anyone or go into that sort of bloody activity. Uh, so, we, we, so democracy does have some uh, merit in so far as it's a very peaceful way of bringing about social change. If the major parties, both of them, or wherever they are, they might not have been, are used instrumentally. Uh, and, and I think that, but that's a long way into the future. Yeah. That's when we've got a majority of population that want more liberty. Mm. I think it's also about, as I say, intelligently support. Uh, I'll just, add, just add, kind of yes, come back on your point quickly. It's also about intelligently supporting movements from a range of political spectrum. I mentioned there the 15M movement in Spain and the Syntagma movement in Greece. Now they're normally considered quite to the far left, but they've created spaces of decentralisation where they say we want our own ability to create our own laws and to develop our own economic models. And I think, well, yeah, that's support that and encourage that where it's useful to kind of remove power in this case from the Greek and Spanish states. I think that there's intelligence there and that's the best way to engage with it. Yeah, I mean, of course, you can work with all kinds of movements on, on specific issues. For example, there's this group, uh, Spiked Online, this magazine, which is a bit strange on many things, yeah. but they're brilliant mm -hmm. on, on, on freedom of speech and they're really vocal about this. Yeah. And why not support them? Exactly, right? no, they are good on that. On other things completely yeah, wrong. Yeah, I, I think they're completely wrong on democracy. I think they're completely <laughs> wrong on another. That's the big one for me. But I think, yeah, but they are great, as you say, on freedom of speech. I think Brendan O'Neill is a great voice on it. They've got Frank Faridi who works there. There's a lot of stuff on, I think. Yeah, uh, Nietzsche, yeah, stuff, I think. Stuff, complete bullshit. Yeah, the, yeah, they were members of the Revolutionary Communist Party. But yeah, there's a weird alliance, up. but it could. It, it looks like it's working. Because they they're competing in universities. That was what they did every night. And they've, they've gone from that to what they are now. Yeah. After they knocked them down. 
Well, they knocked me down and beat them up. Well, very often they didn't knock them down. <laughs> they just beat them up. You know, they just put a few bruises on there. Oh, so not the communism. They didn't always knock them sure. down. <laughs> what is this going on? Well, this is right about 1980. The Warwick University. Not no, they're just... <laughs> well, I blame uh, well, the, the uh, Revolutionary Communist Party. I used well, to call it the Roman well, Catholic they, they Party it, because, I because it supported <laughs> the IRA, so I called it the Roman Catholic Party. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, That's just opportunism, though, isn't it? From them, they just support. Well, I'm surprised that some of those don't support ISIS now. Now it's because it's anti-imperialism <laughs> or something. They, they would if they were yeah. like they were then, yeah. but they developed into what they are now. Yeah. So like the Stop the War Coalition is another good example. There are some good elements of that. But then a couple of years ago, they did release a statement. They quickly retracted it, where they said ISIS are part of the anti-imperialist struggle. And I, I don't know any libertarians who are pro-ISIS, but I don't think that's a good position. <laughs> but John. I'm not sure if there were one knowable, best way to promote libertarianism. I think it would be a very bad idea if everybody tried to follow that. I mean, the more people try different routes, uh, the better. You never know what's going to work. Mm. Uh, we, we, we learn from each other. Sometimes one people work, sometimes we There's a sort of synergy amongst them all. Um, uh, uh, some people are you know, all for ginger groups trying to influence politics in Westminster, and uh, I used to think that's a very bad idea, and now I think, well, no, that's something. I mean, that's what caused Theresa May to say, I am not a libertarian. Uh, uh, more than once, I think, which I think is the best advertisement we could possibly have. I believe it. I would have paid thousands of pounds for that woman to stand up and say, I'm yeah. not a libertarian, so what is she going to be scratching their heads? What is it? Well, yeah. She's not. Yeah. I agree with that. that. Yeah. So there is no one, right? Even within the Labour Party, some of the ideas that have been flouted, not among Jeremy Corbyn, but some of his like even weirder supporters and members of his like internal jur journalism or media team, they've talked about things like left forms of libertarianism, the decentralisation of power that means that people can empower their own communities through community ownership of things. There's benefits to that because it talks about those things where we go, well, as you say, there's not one model and it's about being able to conflagrate in different ways. I mean, I, I guarantee there are people in here I probably wouldn't uh, work with one issue and I wouldn't work with on another because that's just the inevitability of political ideology. And I think, but I think it's the ability to congregate on those different things which is the best way to go about it. What do you mean by work with well, it, well, in terms of activism, in terms of writing, in terms of, you know, I mean, I, I, I've written for, I said for the Centre for a State of Society, but I don't agree with them on many of their feminist views. I've written for the, the Mises Institute, and I don't agree with some of their support for the alt-right. I've written for the um, Sean Gabbs Libertarian Alliance before it became the Mises UK. I'm not fully supportive of their ideas on immigration. And I think it's about being able to kind of develop those links into a wider movement. And Ultimately, there's probably as many kinds of libertarianism yeah, on, on inevitably. Any one day, <laughs> at any one moment. But uh, why, why any, they get split into sex, we expel people? I can't understand the motivation of sex or the expelling of people. You know, uh, you can have complete Re debate without any expelling. It's part of human nature. <laughs> well, no, it's not. I mean, there's, there's no reason why. I mean, there's, there's no reason why uh, sex should expel people over the ideology. Now, of course, we did have a split in the LA, but it wasn't over the ideology. Well, obviously you get that you get that problem with the radical yeah. left as well then as well that they can't form anything coherent. It, was, well, it wasn't over ideology; it was over Chris Tain. It was over Chris Tain, yeah. yeah. Over a weekend. Over a weekend. <laughs> but it's like it's over all together now. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Yeah. Did you want to speak? Yeah. So we just you also see hope in um, sort of development of uh, specifically a libertarian alternatives. For instance, Bitcoin was an explicit libertarian yes. model. Yes. Uh, yeah, Bitcoin's an interesting one. It. it because it, it, it's actually attracted more than just libertarians recently. I've, I've seen a lot of people who come from what could be even a kind of socially liberal perspective, you know, the kind of people who might vote for Hillary Clinton. And they've gone, well, there's a lot of interesting stuff about Bitcoin in terms of how, how we can create different forms of constitutions of economic and social relations through it. And I think, well, great, and I wouldn't mind working with people on that. It's a fantastic thing. Yeah, the blockchain, is, I think, is even better than Bitcoin, though, precisely because it's got so much more to offer in terms of the ability to create anonymous ledgers, the ability to develop 
not just alternative currency, but alternative forms of socioeconomic engagement. So you, you can allow people to have that one foot out of the state instead, instead of both feet in. My view is like, uh, if you don't really have a fundamental sort of driving principle, uh, then an alternative, you know, you can explain Bitcoin, whatever, but if, if people don't really understand like the core principle of, you know, the use of force and stuff like DNA, yeah. for example, yeah. you'll always fall back to, you know, uh, statism, leftism, and um, uh, I, my opinion would be to push the, the, the principle first. And it, you know, the, the alternatives are there as examples, but I, yeah. to me, it's, it should be the focus because you can you can sort of get prepped and uh, sort of lost in all the details of a particular implementation. Mm -hmm. Some people might see it differently. And for example, like, uh, you know, the common argument is when uh, we, we, you know, we had slavery before and you would say to someone, well, who supports slavery? Well, how would the quality be picked? And obviously, somebody couldn't foresee that we would have uh, harvesters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so really, we don't know the alternative. That's our point of libertarianism. It's like we, we don't actually we want people to do what they should do, whatever, without restriction. And, and but the core principle is what is what. I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, though. I, they're not mutually exclusive. No, but I think, you're, I, I think the issue is, is if you focus too much on the principles, you get lost in the internal debates. There are many different interpretations of the NAP within radical libertarianism, and this is precisely the problem I've seen with the radical left, is once they start getting into the, the simple, what they consider their basic axioms, they never get out of it again. And I think the ability to look at alternatives that have existed is that they, they have different ways of engagement. So I mentioned the men's sheds movement. You know, that, I mean, that is just... It's, it's, it's a group of people men who... Men in sheds. Yeah, men in sheds creating things and developing things and sharing them in their networks either in where they meet up or over the internet. Like a maker? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. The maker spaces are a part of that to an extent. And that, that engages with people on a, a different level of principle than the non-aggression principle does. And I think you can begin to develop those decentralized ideas through engagement with it. As I said, with Bitcoin, it's attracted people who are socially liberal. That's, you know, that's quite interesting. It, the, the way that the polarization of the, the, the polarization that the US election has created has meant that people who are normally pro-democrat have talked about secession. Now, you may say that oh, well, all it will do is decentralize their own stupidities to a smaller country, but that's the point. They can't do the same thing on a smaller scale. They can't do the same stupid things on the level of New York as they can on the level of the United States. And it's about m moving, people to moving people towards those positions in many different ways, whether that means engaging with movements that seem quite small, like makerspaces, or looking at exploiting the kind of divisions that uh, the US uh, the elections have created. And I think that, that you can move people toward the principles of saying, look, we should encourage non-aggression, voluntarism, and those kind of ideas, instead of simply focusing on the principles first and then pushing towards the alternatives. Just illustrations. Yeah, because I, I'm looking like people in Bitcoin, for example, they join the movement, they think it's great. And then they say, well, maybe we should have a, a body that, you know, yeah. regulates the whole thing. And maybe yeah. it should be a global intergovernmental body. Yeah. And it's like, well, why? <laughs> you know I, mean? I know what you mean. Yeah, I think... What, what's also good about that is, as a result of that, many more cri cryptocurrencies have been created which encourage different principles. So you've had Dogecoin, Litecoin, and, and those are just the big ones. You know, there are thousands of cryptocurrencies as a result, and they all have their own little communities and all, all their own little ideas. So I think it... And that encourages the dynamics I want to see, which is if, if you're part of a polity that, and you think, God, this is really moronic what they're doing, and I've got 40% of people who agree with me, instead of trying to vote and saying, oh, well, it's, we've lost the will of majority, we go, well, we want to move away from that, and we want to have our own space. And that's where I think those principles begin to be seen. all sorts of that as people's kind of cultural views become irreconcilable yeah. with existing countries. So you had that brief flash of London nationalism after the, <laughs> yeah. of the EU referendum. You had talks of Calexit, Texit, if everyone. Yeah. So I think that kind of thing is going mainstream. Mm -hmm. You see people like maybe on sort of the sort of the outer edges of the sort of libertarian movement, like people like Nick Land or Mencius Moldberg saying like divorce talk is going mainstream. So yeah. I think the sort of decent fragmenting of these large sort of unions like the United Kingdom and mm -hmm. you know, the American Union into smaller states is, seems to be like yeah. getting traction. 
And, it does, and it, as you say, it does attract people from a wide range of perspectives. Yeah. You mentioned Moldberg and Land. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't. I wouldn't normally expect those that 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 kind of ideology to move towards that because they're kind of part of the alt right supposedly. I yeah. think they're a bit more one foot in, one foot out. But yeah, and the alt right seems to be very pro national, pro nationalism, very pro state. And yet, as you say, yeah, they, they are beginning to talk about secession. Doesn't mean I necessarily want to work with them on everything or most things. But again, it, weird movements with weird ideas are beginning to kind of revolve around these certain axioms. Yeah. Anyone else? You shut them up, I think. No. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, we'll carry on in the bar, anyhow, there's anything to carry on. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. No worries, that's fine. <laughs>